सो ऑन सिंपली कनेक्टेड मैनिफोल्ड द थर्ड एंड द फर्स्ट एंड थर्ड कोमोलॉजी आर गोइंग टू बैलिश सो द ओनली होमोलॉजी दैट यू हैव इज द सेकेंड होमोलॉजी एंड दिस थिंग हैज अज अ पेरिंग ऑन इट can think of these as if these two h2s are uh, represented by cycles we count the intersections of those cycles with multiplicity so uh, topological analysis <coughs> all the information that you have and um, there is a theorem of milner which says that uh, so this is called the intersection form so this theorem says that the homotopy type of x is determined by the intersection form and this uses another theorem Another related theorem is actually, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure which came before, but one proof of this Milner's theorem is we are the second theorem I'm going to state is that if you if you have a, a certain kind of um, cobordism uh, between two manifolds, four manifolds of Yeah. So if you have two manifolds with the same intersection form, then they are edge coordinate. So, so two manifolds of the bow form. So we, which means that they are simply connected and not part of the entire. The two four manifolds which are simply connected and have same with same. intersection form uh h coordinate what that what this word means is um what this means is that there exists a a a five manifold with x and y as boundary components so you have to so this is kind of the picture which is always drawn for cobordism so <coughs> so x and y could uh, look different but they are the boundaries of this larger five dimensional manifold with one of them is given the positive orientation and another is a negative orientation um such that and it sorry at uh, that that uh, form q is that the uh, cup product yes yeah and it's a special uh, it's it's not just a cobordism it's an edge cobordism that means that w is simply connected and uh it does not have a relative second cohomology so and finally there's a theorem of snail which says that uh, for dimensions uh, five and above edge cobordism implies diffeomorphism so uh, if if x and y are have dimension five or greater and are edge cobordism implies these are diffeomorphic 
and further, <coughs> there's more. Uh, any edge cobordism is diffeomorphic to a product of uh, uh, cobordism. Product. So product cobordism means that X and Y have to be diffeomorphic and you're just taking a product with the interval. Uh, so but this, this theorem does not hold for four dimensions. And uh, the the invariants produced from these AFD moduli spaces, they it holds topology. Huh? It holds topology. No, but this is a statement about diffeomorphism. So, uh, so, you, you, so in fact, uh, so we are Donaldson's invariants. You can get uh, results of the following types. You can get examples of uh, non diffeomorphic <coughs> manifolds with the same intersection form. Non diffeomorphic manifolds with the same intersection form. There's examples of uh, edge cobordisms which are not products. And, um, and there are also results of the form that uh, certain Qs cannot be uh, realized uh, for smooth manifolds. So, and uh, but those same that so there are Qs which uh, are intersection forms for topological manifolds, but not for smooth manifolds. So, so certain Qs are not the intersection forms for. There is a, this is some motivation for why one studies uh, AST moduli spaces. some conditions. So you are excluding some cues uh, from being the intersection forms of a smooth manifold. So if you have a topological manifold with that intersection form, then you can't be the answer. Exactly. The, the exactly. Yeah. That's what it means, yes. OK, so now uh, I kind of uh, recall the definition of our ASD connections. We were working in the G equals SU two case, so we saw that uh, dimension of manifold is four. So, if for any kind of two forms, you can take values of anything you want. The hot star uh, gives an isomorphism, and uh, so this thing breaks up. Uh, splits into self dual and anti self dual forms. Okay, uh, so this is 
should pull it back. Um, and uh, we also defined the Young Mills connection. Sorry, Young sorry Young Mills uh, function. Uh, Young Mills functional is defined on the space of connections, its values and fields, and it maps a connection to the norm square of the curvature. So it can be written like this. We had a way of put, uh, uh, we had a way of defining metrics on forms, and using that metric, you can define the norm square. And that's that's what it was. And uh, and by the splitting, this guy splits into a self dual and anti self dual components. And finally, we also saw that the difference of the self-dual and the anti-self-dual components was a topological invariant, which is a pi square times the second Schoen class of the bundle. So putting these two observations together, we can say that uh, uh, this implies that a AST connections are minima of young Mills function. Variation, uh, what's it called? Like, uh, the calculus of variations, uh, characterization of the minimum of the Young Mills functional, which is, which looks like this. So, a connection which satisfies this equation is called a Young Mills connection. So, it's a short derivation, but it's literally saying that. Uh, if you take this functional and differentiate it in any direction in the space of connections, the derivative vanishes. So this is it. this is exactly that thing. So it's a cal calculus of variation statement. It's like an Euler Lagrange equation. So this is the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay. So so in order to con uh, so we are interested in this thing, AST connections modulo gauge. So for that, uh, before we get there, let's just first look at this is the space of connections modulo gauge transformations. So this is going to be an infinite dimensional space, but let's try and understand it a little. So firstly, I claim that the space has a metric on it. It's going to be so B has a metric. And the metric is of the following form. So if A0 and A1 are connections, you define the distance between them as the so the thing is this, so these are both gauge orbits of connections. So there is lots of connections in each of them. So we, uh, we need to kind of measure the minimum distance between these two. So, and so that's exactly what the distance function is. Um, And 
uh, I just point out that the way we were taking, uh, do you see that we don't have to put G in both these places? We don't have to put G1 here and G2 there? Because uh, the, the metric is uh, gauge invariant. So it's enough to put G on one side. <coughs> so the main, so the triangle inequality is easy here. So the main uh, tricky thing is that we need to show that if if the distance is zero, uh, these two are actually gauge equivalent to each other. such that uh, right so and let me let me work in local coordinates and uh, represent both these connections using matrices So the way these two A0 and A1 are uh, related is as, um, so let's also, uh, so so let's maybe, uh, let's say this, Bn A0 minus A1 is equal to Bn, a new connection, which is, uh, Noted as D plus little d. Thank you. So yeah, so that's a good point. So D is just a, a form. Have um, a one plus uh, b n is equal to g a zero g two plus plus sorry minus b g plus is that is that okay? So I'm just. Uh, I've just rewritten yeah, that. Yes. Will it happen on its own, the light coming back? Or you have to do something? <laughs> Just rewritten this statement, and now these are all just matrices, so we can uh, move them around. So let so let me just by rearranging the terms, I get D G N is equal to G N A naught minus A one G N minus 
beaten, cheated, right? And um, and remember that G N are maps to uh, a compact group. Which means that uh, can any, everybody see the board uh, with this? If the light goes off. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so this, these are maps to a compact group. So we can say that the L2 norm of these guys is bounded, right? Uh, and this tells you that, um, that the L2 norm of this guy is also bounded. Because uh, A0, A1, Bn, all the L2 norms are bounded. And these GNs are not just in L2, we have a, a L infinity bound. So, so, so by multiplying, you are uh, not changing the L2 norm by more than a constant. So we have a L2 uh, control over DGN. So, so which which means that. Um, Okay, now I have to be a little vague. So the idea is this: uh, we then so, so this uh, G N is bounded in a um, uh, in H one Sobolev space. So so it uh, so it weakly converges to a limit, and basically we can you uh, use, use that to bootstrap our um, convergence. So so now. Uh, Yeah, so I, I, at this point, I just have to mumble a little bit. So when you have a certain convergence for GN, you can improve the convergence of the A's. And then using that, you can improve the con convergence of GN and keep iterating. So, and you don't have to even have to iterate too much. All you need to say is that you actually don't need too much. Like this gives you that GN um, converges weakly. So this is weak convergence to a limit g infinity. And you just need enough to say that uh, this convergence is enough to say that g infinity is, is going to satisfy that thing. So which can be done using some, um, some Sobolev spaces stuff. So the, the, the main point is this, that um, kind of the qualitative model to take out of this is that if you have gauge transformations which are relating small connection matrices, then the gauge transformations themselves are small. Which probably is not terribly important today, but it's a handy thing when you're doing some gauge theory. So, so uh, yeah. So basically, we have shown that that space uh, has a metric. Now let's see um, what is needed to have a manifold structure. So, uh, how in a on a on a fi in a finite dimensional setting, if you are if you have a quotient, how do you construct a manifold structure on the quotient? You have to find a slice. Yeah. So you take, uh, you try and find a slice. So let, we'll do the same thing here. So let's, if you are starting out at a uh, connection A naught. So we hope to slice for the gauge group action. So the gauge orbits I'm representing this way. So this is G 
A naught and if I have seen A1 here, this G A1 and uh, I hope to take this to be kind of the minimum possible distance like what we were trying to do there. Um, but I won't go for a uh, absolute minimum, I, I just want to find a, a, like a calculation of sorry a calculus of variations style equation so i i would like to say that uh, a1 is in the uh, slice at a0 so i'm trying to construct a, a manifold structure <coughs> in a neighborhood of a0 okay so, uh, so I want so I want to see which of my connections in this neighborhood lie on this slice. So, so you want to say that um, when you and uh, any element of the when you act by anything on the gauge group, you increase the distance. So when you look at the infinitesimal action of the gauge group. Uh, you, this is uh, this satisfies a minimum condition, a derivative vanishing condition, and I can write it down as um, um, so a one is in the slice if this derivative vanishes at zero, and this is. Uh, C is an element of the Lie algebra of the gauge group, which is what? The, the PG yes. section. So the section of PG. So remember that uh, uh, the gauge group can be thought of as a section of a bundle whose fibers are G. So this is the corresponding section whose fibers are the Lie algebra. So this is uh, so th this seems uh, reasonable to ask for, right? So let's differentiate this. So in order to differentiate, we need to know how to differentiate this guy. Uh, and I'll just tell you what it is. So it's just a covariant derivative of the C. And it, in, in local in local coordinates, if A1 is D plus A1, little A1, then this guy is uh, D C plus A1 D bracket C. So so now, now let's write it down. So this is, uh, this derivative is, uh, so we can think of this as a pairing of an inner product, right, and just differentiate, so, uh, like get a product group. A0 minus A1, which in turn is equal to minus B A1 C comma A0 minus A1, right? Um, and this is true. This is zero for all C in the Lie algebra, A algebra of the gauge group, right? So when you see something like this, you take a joint, right? So, so this happens when that is zero. So, uh, and this condition is symmetric. So if you have this, you will also have a uh, e naught star. 
and which is kind of you, you can see that yeah yeah you if you just move this thing here and do the differentiation you'll get the other term okay so this is the this is the coulomb gauge condition Uh, so we say that A1 is in Coulomb gauge with respect to A0 if this uh, differential equation is satisfied. What does it mean physically? Just this. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, this is just an expression? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. transformations we can move here. So uh, one does need that. Yeah, maybe I should state that. I was yeah, so uh, this is implicit function theorem argument will show you that for a given a naught, there exists a neighborhood such that for connections lying inside that neighborhood, there exists a small gauge transformation, which is a function of A1. This is a gauge transformation. What kind of implicit function theorem are we using? I mean, these are infinite dimensional models. Uh, so yes. I mean, so we, we first complete them. So yes. So we need to work in solvable spaces. Yeah. And even this, I I I won't just take an L two norm here. I'll take a better norm than that. Maybe let me use this opportunity to say what this norm is. Uh, let me finish writing this statement and then get to it. So there exists a small, so this thing will be in one derivative higher, such that e to the h a1 So basically, you want to say that uh, the size of h is controlled by the distance between a1 and a0. So in, in some sense, this gauge transformation varies smoothly as you vary this connection. So really, what you are trying to say is that when you are constructing your charts, you don't want a far away connection to end up here and a close by connection to be taken far away. So to preserve the expect the quotient topology of that space, uh, we need this kind of uh, continuity result. Okay, um, and what these Sobolev spaces are, I'm literally going to write two lines about it because if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, it's at this point. So um, so what this is is um, so let let me just work on um, functions on bounded domains in Rn and let let me look at real value functions and I'll define a norm on this. So this is a bounded domain. So this 
so so I'm let us so you define a norm uh, which I call the L two uh, K norm. So by the way, this is also called H K. If uh, you're more familiar with that, so this norm is it measures not just the L two norm of F, but it takes derivative up to order k and measures the L2 norm of all those things and adds it up. Okay. And the space L2k over u is actually I need this. Um, so this uh, Sobolev space is the completion of smooth functions under this norm. And uh, since we are considering, so L2 spaces are Hilbert spaces, there is an uh, obvious product there. Uh, so similarly, these spaces are also uh, Hilbert spaces. But if you were to replace this 2 by p, if you consider L, K, P, or also called W, K, P, then uh, those are not, those are just Banach spaces. <coughs> okay, and the reason we need these spaces is because uh, we'll be using um, elliptic operators, and those operators work best on Sobolev spaces. So even uh, to, so like, uh, let me not uh, prove this result, but let's see what happens in a very simple case. So an easy case is where, uh, let's just take a trivial S1 button. Okay. Trivial S1 button. So, um, and let me take A0 to be my trivial connection. So, by the way, uh, note, I wanted to uh, say one more thing. Maybe that will be, uh, this, let's do this first. So, when you have a, a, a trivial connection and you were trying to the Coulomb gauge. So, so given b plus a, the question is find uh, uh, an h which is now just a map from m to r such that uh, e to the This is the Coulomb gauge condition, and in this case, it uh, right. In this case, it simplifies uh, drastically. All we are asking for is d star uh, a plus d h is zero. You re remember that uh, when you uh, for a for a, for an abelian group. The gauge group action is just given by addition plus doing plus dg, right? So, so, so the infinitesimal version is the same. In fact, if you look at this, we did uh, right. So, this d bracket term drops out. So we just have a d c term, which is a d h in this case. So we want to find an h so that this equation is satisfied. And um, how to do that? Um, so for functions, this guy 
it's just the Laplacian. So we are trying to solve <coughs> the Laplace equation. Right? And this is, um, you know, I need some formalism here, but uh, on if you take the L2 product, the uh, uh, Laplacian is self adjoint. And you've been seeing Hodge theorem and all that. So, um, so the basically the uh, since it's self adjoint, the kernel will be same as co kernel, and the kernel consists of constant functions. So, so, uh, so S is in kernel if exactly if it is constant. And that's uh, easy to see by Stokes theorem because you just multiply and when you apply Stokes theorem, you get Ds from a Ds. So if this is in the kernel, this guy has to be zero, which means Ds is zero. So the co-kernel also is just consists of constants. So, so in order for this to have a solution, this should integrate to 0. So a necessary manifold without boundary by the way. So this guy has a solution. A necessary condition for that is that this function integrates to 0. Because um, because the integral of g is the integral of push, uh, uh, delta f. You can just multiplied by 1 and take Stokes theorem. functions, they together they span the whole space, whichever space you are considering, right, which has to be at least L1 because we need that integrability condition. Okay, so now uh, we, so in order to solve for uh, this guy, we just need to check that uh, d star a integrates to 0, which is uh, We do the same trick here, d star a. So here we are. Uh, yeah, we are still in the real numbers as our target. So, <coughs> so indeed, uh, my uh, right hand side integrates to zero, which means that I can indeed solve for h. So. The idea for this implicit function, so, uh, so this means that uh, yeah, what do I write here? Yeah, I've basically we have shown that we can do it. I have not written anything properly. So, so the idea uh, for this implicit function theorem is similar. Uh, the in the when you do the implicit function theorem, at some point you have to prove that uh, some 
operator is surjective, mm -hmm. right? And that's uh, what we were trying to do here. So th that that will be just a glorified version of this, and there will. Uh, so you have to just do it more carefully. Except there is one issue which we won't uh, see from this thing, but uh, we'll see it in another way. We do require that uh, the gauge group action is free, otherwise we won't be able to get a slice. It won't exactly be free, but as free as possible. So that, that's the next thing I'm coming to. Before I get there, let me uh, say a few more lines about this manifold structure. So the chart at A0 will be of this form. It will be A0 plus A when B A0 star A is 0 and we consider small A's. Uh, and so I need to take this k so that uh, <coughs> k plus 1 is greater than 2, that is k is greater than 1. Because if, if in that case uh, the the space of uh, L2k is... K plus 1 into 2 is bigger than 4. Exactly, yeah. So, so uh, so the reason we need this is because uh, the space of gauge transformations, which needs to be one higher, uh, acts and this is a smooth action in this topology. Um, If, um, so that is one thing, this is smooth and secondly another thing is that the curvature map which will go from uh, to k to uh, two forms with value there and what will be the k here, like what will be the Sobolev index here? One yeah, because the expression for curvature, recall, was something like this, right? So it involved taking a derivative. So if you are allowed to take k derivatives here, when you go there, you can only take k minus one derivatives, right? And um, and there is a multiplication term. So for that, <coughs> some conditions on the the Sokolov index. Yeah, so basically everything works out fine if <coughs> k is greater than one, and in particular these uh, these gauge transformations they have they have to be about the Sobolev borderline. So which means that uh, two uh, k plus one twice of k plus one has to be greater than. So the basic thing to remember is that these gauge transformations have to be about Sobolev borderline. Anyway, if you have not seen Sobolev spaces, you know that piece of information. Okay, so the chart looks like this, and um, and uh, recall this is some from Hodge theory that we have this splitting.
um, so this is uh, this is an uh, these two spaces are orthogonal in L two. The splitting carries over to uh, higher regularity spaces also. That's what Hodge theory tells us. So 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 basically, uh, with this we can say that if the image of uh, D A has the look same for nearby connections then the tangent space is going to look similar for uh, connections in the neighborhood of A0. Uh, I'll say it again. So the, the tangent space of A0 is modeled on kernel of uh, the A0 star. And, but we don't know what kind of operator this is. But from Hodge theory, we know that uh, we have this kind of a splitting of one forms. So, so out of the total space, so initially we were just starting out with an affine space. So if what we are, if the normal direction that we are taking out looks similar in a neighborhood, then uh, we indeed get a manifold structure. So that's roughly the idea. And, and what is this image DA? Image DA is exactly uh, these uh, infinitesimal gauge group actions. So if uh, the if the orbit has uh, looks similar for nearby connections, then we get a manifold structure. So then we are so we are saying that the stabilizers are of the same size. That's roughly what we are saying. So let's get to the stabilizers. dimensional situation if uh, if g acts on a finite dimensional manifold and x star is the set of points in x where g acts freely then uh, x star g is a manifold and under some more hypothesis. We, uh, like for example, if G is compact, or if you have some other structure, we might be even be able to say that this quotient is a stratified space. So, in indeed, in this case, that's what we will get. Okay. So let's uh, talk about stabilizers. What are the, uh, let's just take a very simple case of a trivial connection on a trivial button. So what are the uh, stabilizers of this connection? So let, let's write down this expression. Firstly, let's, this is 
is actually plus a zero here. So when you apply g dot a, what do you get? D plus one. What is it in uh, this trivialization that we are given? Yes, because this is a. Uh, um, Although I'm writing it this way, this is a little confusing because this was the expression for the connection one forms. So when you apply a gauge transformation here, what you get is D plus and the A part is a joint of G applied to A minus G this. Yes, we, we all remember that. Right. So, so in this case, the A is just 0. So then what are we left with? I mean, A must be constant. Exactly. So, so the connection we get is just D, G, G inverse because this term is 0. Right? Is a, uh, just ask questions if you want to because there is no real target here. Calculation okay. Okay. So so this is your gauge transform connection, and you want this to be equal to D, which implies this is constant. So uh, it kind of gives a sense that the stabilizing groups are not huge; they are just one one dimension. Fine, they are finite dimensions. Yes, I mean, the subgroups of G. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another remark is so take a general group this time. So suppose this is a constant function such that it maps to the center of the group. Okay. Now this is indeed a, a gauge transformation because uh, although the when you are applying the gauge transformation, uh, the G is twisted around, it's twisted by conjugation. So if uh, even for a general principal bundle, uh, G is a gauge transformation. So it's a constant gauge transformation which maps to the center of the group. Now, uh, now, and if you take an uh, arbitrary connection, any connection. So we are on an arbitrary principle bundle, arbitrary connection, but we have taken a special G which is constant and mapping to the center of the group. So what is? Uh, What is the transform version? It's helped. Because uh, we have our joint will do nothing because it's AG is in the center of the group and DG is 0 because it's constant. So, so these elements are unavoidable. Uh, so in, in, for any connection, at the very least you will have uh, the center of the group as a stabilizer. is going to be definitions. So let's define a subgroup of G as uh, 
apply the polynomial function on any loop. Okay, so let's uh, let's fix a point M not on M, and we consider all loops. So now we are not, it's not a flat connection anymore. So even if you deform the loop, you are going to get different values of the polynomial. So so re remember that uh, polynomial of a closed loop can be identified uh, uh, holonomy for closed loop is just an automorphism of a fiber which can be identified to a group element. So let's fix we the up point. Up, up, up to exactly. So yeah this group will be defined on the up to okay. Okay. Yeah. So but for the time being let's fix a uh, fix a identification. Right? Um, then all possible values of polynomials where comma is a loop based at M0. And uh, so given a connection, we can define, this is called the holonomy subgroup. So we can, this group is uh, defined up to conjugation. Because if you change the uh, M0, point M0, or if you change the identification of the fiber, you end up changing this uh, uh, subgroup by conjugation. And it's easy to convince yourself that it's indeed a group. Okay. And I define another which is simple gauge transformations that fixes the connection. And the, the lemma is that uh, gamma A isomorphic to the centralizer of H A A G. stabilizes a connection, then the oh, holonomy group should uh, commute with that element. That is easy to see because when you apply a gauge transformation uh, that acts on this holonomy by co conjugation and if, you, if it is unchanged then this uh, element lies in the commute. So, but the other direction may need some work. So, you know. Uh, so you can just use that to get the other direction also. Yeah. Seems to Yeah, it, it's a it's a short proof, but so basically what we are saying is that the so it uh, the cent the central uh, the stabilizer of a connection is just a subgroup of the finite dimensional group G, the structure group. That's all it is. And for any A, the center has to be contained. So, so what uh, So 
we restrict our attention to um, uh, irreducible connections. So those are connections whose stabilizer is exactly the centralizer of G. Sorry, the center of G. by the conjugacy group of its stabilizer. So you get a, a, like a finite number of levels, right? And so each of those would be smooth manifolds. And so this would be uh, kind of the open set and the smaller things would lie in its closure. So then, and when you move to the next level, the the things uh, which have even bigger stabilizer will lie in their closure and so on. So it will have that kind of a structure. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to ASD modular space. just means uh, carry out the operation and then project it to the uh, self-adjoint forms. So DA and A wedge A are both two forms and you project them to the self-adjoint forms. That's the notation here. So those are, the, we are looking for the solutions of uh, the system of equations and uh, Yeah, one of them is written in simple coordinates, the other one is written in the other coordinates, but it doesn't matter. Because if I were in, uh, because if, uh, it's not D plus A, it is A naught plus A, so we do have an A naught there. Make, get things going is that this operator is elliptic. 
So ellipticity gives us a, a bunch of useful properties. So one, um, so f to to kind of uh, derive the advantages of ellipticity, we have to work in superlative spaces. So that's why to start with, we we were in superlative spaces, and. Um, So what ellipticity tells you is that if you view this as a map between Banach spaces, so this will be L two K, and on the other side we will have one degree uh, lower. So one of them would be one piece would be a two form. L two K minus one, and another piece is just sections. L two K minus one. So this is an operator between Banach spaces, and uh, ellipticity tells you that this operator is friend homomorphic. <coughs> and what does friend homomorphic mean? Friend homomorphic means that uh, a closed image. Finite dimensional uh, kernel and co kernel. So, So in order to uh, solve these equations, you use some kind of implicit function theorem, but that would require uh, the, the operator to be surjective. Uh, and if it is surjective, the, the dimension of the moduli space you get will be exactly the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. this on to. So uh, we need some. So what you do in these situations is uh, we will need to perturb the equations a little bit. And the parameter we have in our hands to do the perturbation is, is the Riemannian metric. So there is no, uh, there's no need to use this fixed Riemannian metric. So you take the space of all Riemannian metrics, you can, uh, can construct a universal moduli space, and for a generic metric, this would be a this would be a manifold of the right dimension. Okay, and further, you will also uh, so this this thing is for people who have seen these holomorphic curves. The, 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 this case is a uh, a little trickier than the holomorphic curves case because the dimension is different for uh, like the dimension has more complicated formulas. So, so and you have this additional difficulty <coughs> of avoiding the reducible connections. So, if in in for many uh, in many cases, we can do the perturbation and manage to produce this moduli space so that it does not uh, hit the reducible connections at all. But in some cases, you do have to. Uh, deal with the reducible connections and see what it does in the AST moduli space also. 
so uh, so there is a whole variety of phenomenon that happens and uh, and fi uh, finally uh, 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 so these Donaldson invariants are defined as um, so in, uh, in again in some cases these uh, uh, modular spaces just turn out to be zero dimensional so they are defined as counts of uh, ASD the Donaldson invariants are just counts of um, these things but in, in when it's higher dimension then you define some cycles in the ASD moduli space and count the intersections and that's how the Donaldson invariants are defined and um, and so when you are uh, so when you're doing all this essentially you are doing an integral over the moduli space of ASD connections so there is one more uh, question that needs to be asked compactness so you can only integrate if the space is compact and if it's not compact, you need to see what the ends are. And uh, and in this case, the ends are so. Let me uh, tell you one other result when when we are thinking of compactness. So let me not write down the results. So there is a thing called Ullenbeck compactness, which uh, basically that works if if you have a sequence of. Uh, it's better to write down. Uh, let A I be a sequence of connections. Uh, and such that, so, so I should say, um, um, with LP norm of the curvature is perfect, and we require P to be greater than. So if P is greater than half the dimension of the manifold, then you have uh, Ullenberg compactness, which says that these converge modulo gauge. So, so uh, AI is converge modulo gauge. We get subsequent. Yes, yes, after passing to a subsequent. So whereas in our case, uh, we have an L2 bound and we are on a four dimensional space. So we don't have Ullenbeck compactness. So uh, the phenomenon that happens is Maybe I should add one line in this. Converge in in W1P. So this is LP, and first element is also in LP. So that is the topology which it converges. Um, so uh, suppose it be a sequence of ASD connections. And um, on, on the principal bundle P, where churn class is k, sorry, second churn class is k, then a subsequence 
converges to a strange object, which is a connection, which is going to be on a different bundle and a multi-set of points on the manifold. So basically, you have a concentration of the curvature density at a few uh, finite number of points. So you have this multi-set of points. subset of M. And A is a ESD connection on a different principal bundle whose second churn class is K minus L. So you lose that much energy at each of these points. And the notion of convergence is as follows. Converges. Um, is for all. So this is like this test function which you integrate against this, and you think of your uh, curvatures are as being measures on M. Uh, the curvature densities are, you think of those as being measures on M and you are essentially saying that those measures converge. And these measure... Yeah, so the Dirac measures at yeah, so we have Dirac measures at those points. So it's plus so 8 times square plus 4 x r. So this is, and that's one thing, you need the convergence of curvature densities. And the, the second point is that away from these points, you have a reasonable convergence. So, but you need to keep track of the fact that we are on different bundles. So if we need a, an identification away from these points. So there exists bundle maps um, rho i from p prime restricted to m minus these points to p m minus those points such that when you pull back your sequence to the new bundle on the punctured manifold. This converges, it converges a, in C infinity on compact subsets. Again, like uh, this, the, the ends often cannot be ignored. Like the ends do figure in some cases, and again, in some cases, it doesn't matter. So it, there is like a whole lot of examples which behave in different ways in the Donaldson Kronheimer book. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, uh, what is the book? Uh, it's Geometry of Four Manifolds mm -hmm. uh, by Donaldson and Kronheimer. It's it's a it's a difficult book to read. So you, you basically you need a, a, some background because it somewhat does.